This conference will now be recorded. Jean M. Vloyanitis joined the faculty of Brookdale Community College in 1983. For many years, she served as a librarian providing reference services, research instruction, and collection development in the areas of history, social sciences, the college archives, and New Jerseyana. In 2016, she became a full-time member of Brookdale's History Department, teaching courses in both world civilizations and American civilization. Jean holds a bachelor degree in classics from Douglas College, a master's degree in library service from Rutgers University, and a master's degree in history from Monmouth University. Her history interests are eclectic. During recent years, she has researched the long walls of classical Athens and the Woodstock Music and Art Festival of 1969 for presentations and museum exhibits. As a Jersey girl, local history will always have a special place in her heart. So without further ado, I pass it off. Thank you so very much for that kind introduction. So everybody can hear me okay, just to making sure that I'm going through. Um, so, um, here we have uh, this wonderful evening with oppressive heat. And uh, was it last week we were dealing with tornadoes and of course we're in the throes of a pandemic. So what better time is there to go back and go into the 17th century and see you know, when life was really tough so that we have a sense of perspective. So, um, so I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics and one of my one of my ancestors, Penelope Stout. So I'm related to Penelope through my mother's side of the family. Um, so we've got uh, we've got some Browns and some Woolies and some Throckmortons and some Greens that eventually lead back to the Stout. So I I became interested when I uh, you know have worked with New Jersey history and then when I learned that uh, Penelope was perhaps a uh, a relative, I became even more interested in her. So uh, what I'm gonna do tonight is um, talk about her in the sense that I may not be revealing much new content um, about her to you, but there's different ways we can imagine uh, Penelope. And so let me just make sure I can advance the screen here. Okay, so. I'm hitting the space bar, but it's not advancing. Do you have a suggestion for what I can do? So do you, if you scroll, if you have your... Um, My mouse? Yeah, do you get a little, um, uh, what's the word I want? Um, buttons to move forward over in the lower left-hand corner? Um, no. Or the other thing is, do you have an arrow on your keyboard? Does that move it forward for you? Yeah, because it worked the other day when we tried it. So let me try this. Nope, not working. Okay, let me try. I am frozen here. Okay. Should we? Um, let me think for a second. I'm trying to think. Is there a, a way to drive from the top of the screen on the menu? I've got options, control, remote control, drawing tools. No, I mean within um, the PowerPoint controls, not the GoToMeeting controls. I, when I hit escape to leave the full screen view, it won't, won't work. Okay, so. so why don't you go ahead? Do you um, have the controls to stop sharing your screen? Mm, okay, that would be, if I hit the screen here, did I do the right thing? Yes, so then let's go ahead and share your screen again, please. Okay, so to do that, I am going to go to camera and audio settings, or do, 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 share screen, okay. Is that, is that working now? I'm waiting for it to come up. It might take a second. Okay. Is it showing, you click the blue button to share the screen? Yeah, it's, and I'm seeing it on mine. Can you see it on yours? I forwarded it, it worked because I'm not seeing it on my screen yet, but it might just take a second because it needs. <clears throat> yeah. I click share. Uh, let me try the current slide. Let's see. Is it showing now? No, I don't see it. Okay, let me go down here. 
Okay. I apologize, folks. This is the, the fun of technology here. No, thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, so to share my screen, I need to click on screen. It should be like a little button that yep. looks like a computer screen. Yep, there we go. Okay. Okay. All right, so I see your screen again. And why don't we go ahead and close your um, your browser? Okay, so if I go, but if I go back this way, can yeah. you see it? Can yes. You see it? Okay. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? I, I, mean, I can see it, yes. Okay, good. Okay. Shoot, let's hope this works going forward. Okay. Let's we'll see what, what happens next. So at any rate, um, so I want to contextualize Penelope Stout in terms of the things that we do know about her, uh, recognize the possibilities and the limitations of knowing her story. So part of what we want to do is look at her as one of the iconic women figures of New Jersey uh, folklore. And of course, uh, New Jersey has its fair share of different uh, characters. Uh, you know, we have uh, we have uh, Molly Pitcher, who is a composite of several women uh, fighting, you know, assisting during the Revolutionary War, and she emerges, uh, you know, notably at the Battle of Monmouth as a figure. And then, of course, we have uh, the Jersey Devil, born of, of Mother Leeds, right? A truly uh, mythological uh, creature there with his horse head and his uh, human body and his bat wings. And you know, so we have Mother Leeds giving birth for the thirteenth time and saying, "Okay." You know, this is it. This time, I'm going to have the devil. So we get a whole get a whole spectrum of uh, of different characters in New Jersey folklore. And Penelope, you know, unless you're a stout, um, people from New Jersey have heard to some extent of Penelope, but unless you're a stout elsewhere, you know, not so well known. Uh, but she becomes an important person as as a figure of what you might characterize as myth history, because she is um, somebody who has a, uh, a you know, a definite uh, existence. We, we, we know that she is an ancestor, but there are certain elements of, of, her, of her life and what she has uh, done for us um, as an ancestor that we're still, you know, questioning, trying to figure out, and perhaps we're never going to know the answers to those questions. So one of the approaches that we can take is to look at her as a figure of our national character and uh, look at elements of her story to help explain features of our origins. Um, and so, you know, we do this with the recognition that we have no images of what she looked like. Uh, we have limited physical descriptions. The main descriptions that have come around about her are the descriptions of the injuries that she suffers as a result of being attacked by the uh, Lenape that that uh, sees upon her and her uh, first husband. Um, there are no writings left about her, uh, you know, other than you know, no writings of her own, but only the the stories that get passed down and then eventually get written uh, up. So you know, so we we have really limited um, historical evidence. So how do we fill in those gaps? So we start to look at what we do know for sure, and then we look at the bigger picture. So there's a there's a world historian by the name of Leftin Stavrianos, and he suggests that one approach to kind of understanding history is to step back and look at the big picture. So in other words, if you were to go visit the moon and look at the earth, you're going to get a total view of the earth and you're going to get a perspective of looking at the earth that you can't get when you're walking on the earth. So it's like taking that far ranging uh, look to get an idea of who Penelope was in her time and place. So we have to um, you know, take a few things into account as we think about who Penelope was in her time and place. We have to recognize that she's coming from European society, we have patriarchy, male controlled society. So women, you know, they are, uh, they are under the control of men. And, you know, this could explain one reason why that in some places where she's mentioned, she's only mentioned as the wife of a Dutchman. She doesn't have a name of her own. Um, mm -hmm. You know, her loyalty to her husband will be all important. Um, so we have to take that into account. And then we have to take into account 
uh, you know, where she's coming from and where she's going to. So we'll start to take a look at those elements. So let me see if this next uh, slide is gonna go through. No, so it looks like I'm gonna have trouble every time I want to advance. All right, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna ask you for, um, did you just get a request for me to take over? Yeah, okay. So if you could, can you advance to the next slide? I'm trying. And okay. when you click on the screen, what does it do? When I click on this, well, when I usually hit the space bar and then it just brings up the thing. The, right, um, but if you click on, on the, the screen, screen, like click on the PowerPoint itself. Okay, let me try that and see. Nothing. Oh, there, oh, we go. there it goes. Okay, there might be a okay. little bit of a delay. Okay, thank you. All right, good, good. So, so, um, so here are a, uh, a few uh, things about Penelope that have emerged over the years. And, and, and this uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not panel, um, I saw that, uh, uh, I believe it was the Historical Society used this in their promotion. There's a couple times that Penelope's story appeared in Ripley's Believe It or Not over the years. So, um, you know, this one in particular, when I saw this, I said, ah, I have to put this in because it's got a, a few things in it. Um, you know, Ripley's claims to pride themselves on the authenticity of the uh, historical information that they wouldn't dare to publish something that is not historically accurate. So when I looked at this, I said, okay, let's start out with the picture here. So what do we got, what do we got going on here? So we have this Indian attacking a woman and what are they, what are they next to? Well, they're next to a, wagon right this is like a covered wagon for for pioneers traveling westward um does that sound like what was going on with penelope when she was shipwrecked um don't think so so you know so they've taken probably some stock artwork and applied it so um so you know uh, not a particularly truthful uh depiction of the setting and then of course they continue from there with the information most likely drawing upon one of the uh, early accounts that has since been discredited, the, the, um, the Benedict account in terms of the dates. So we get, uh, we get some you know, information here about uh, Penelope being born in 1602, and that's uh, you know, pretty uh, controversial at this point. Uh, so, so we've got things like that. So, um, and of course, one of the other things that, that gets uh, talked about that is uh, controversial is, you know, how many descendants, uh, the length of her life. So, you know, we get we get the adaptation here in Ripley's Believe It or Not, uh, you know, to really give the most uh, sensational account of her life for, you know, for publication. Um, so, many people, if you're, if you don't know that you're related to Penelope, if you, if you haven't had a family story passed down to you, um, a lot of people, particularly from New Jersey, learned about the Penelope Stout story from this collection, Stories of New Jersey by Frank Stockton. And uh, Frank Stockton uh, first published his collection back in 1896. And uh, Rutgers would issue edition after edition after edition, lots of editions of the Stories of New Jersey, which included you know, one chapter on Penelope's story. And, um, that's how I became acquainted with Penelope. I got this book as a present when I was in middle school. And uh, so the thing that's interesting about the Frank Stockton treatment, so it gains a fairly wide readership of people who are interested in learning stories about the history of New Jersey. But uh, Stockton, when he writes his stories, he takes an approach very similar to Mark Twain. He's a contemporary of Mark Twain's, and um, he doesn't he doesn't uh, give any dates. Um, he uses other versions of the story, and so he doesn't do any original research. But he does cite the earlier sources he looks at. So um, so it is you know an interesting tale, but it's not exactly documentary history. And then one of the other sources that we've got to, uh, you know, that people go to and have become aware of Penelope's story is through all the many, many genealogies that Stouts have published um, in New Jersey and around the country. So the one that's uh, up here on the screen, this is one that came out in 1901 
by Thomas Hale Streets, and he's tracing his stout line in Delaware. And of course, there's um, when you look on some of the uh, uh, Facebook uh, posts about stouts, you see that there's all kinds of connections to various individuals. A mystery writer, Rex Stout, you know, has a connection to Penelope and lots of other people whose last name is not Stout and so forth. So we get these different genealogies. There was, there's a couple at the Rutgers University collection. There's one um, from uh, 1878 by a Nathan Stout and then another one in, in 1974 by a Claude Stout that also uh, you know, traces the lineage, will repeat their version of, of Penelope's story and then give all the, uh, all the linkages uh, you know, of the particular line of stout that they're looking at. So these are some of the ways that Penelope has been um, shared in recent years and, and given a, a way for people to become acquainted with her. But um, going back to the very first sources, Oops, let's see, let me go see what come back here. Okay, so can everybody see the uh, earliest print sources there? Did that, did that work? Yes, we can okay. see it, thank you. Okay, um, so the very first places where Penelope's story ever gets reported are these two places. The first one is in 1765. So about a hundred years after the founding of, of the Monmouth patent, uh, we get a, a respected writer, Samuel Smith, who, who pens this history of the colony of Nova Caesarea or New Jersey. And so he's the very first person to tell Penelope's story. And um, he, he tells you know, this um, story of a Dutchman and his wife. And um, he doesn't, he doesn't give a specific date. He says at a time when there is fighting going on with the natives up in New England, right? So this is as close as we get to a time frame. So he tells the basic story and, um, and you can tell that clearly since this is being written a hundred years after uh, events in Penelope's life or earlier, uh, that this is something that's been an oral tradition that's been passed down, but he documents it as well as possible. If he's not certain of a fact, he won't include it, which is why rather than giving a name, he says a Dutchman and his wife. Um, the other earliest source for Penelope's story is uh, David Benedict's 1813 general history of the Baptist denomination in America and other parts of the world. So we're talking about a very ambitious piece of writing here. So they systematically go to document different Baptist communities and the histories of those communities. And what's, what's interesting about the Benedict account is uh, they give a, a mention of, uh, of a Baptist denomination in middle, what they say Middleton, not Middletown, but Middleton with an O-N at the end, um, New Jersey, and they make no mention of Penelope. But when they get to Hopewell, that's where they share Penelope's story. So through Jonathan's line that helps found Hopewell, that's the place where they make mention of Penelope's story. And this is where there's some questionable dates put in about 20 years earlier at, at, uh, at the least of, uh, you know, uh, given with what we know today of certain events taking place. Um, but, um, you know, so we've got, we've got um, these two early documented uh, histories that tell Penelope's story. And then from there, you know, over time it gets repeated in other places. And you can generally tell as you look at the sources that uh, come out later, the different writings, you know, that they're taking it from the Smith version or they're taking it from the Benedict version because there are certain ways that they phrase, they, they tell the story. So, um, so we've got um, we've got these two early versions, but um, if we look at the time frame, the context of where Penelope is coming from, why she's uh, coming to uh, the New World, it it starts to flesh it out a little bit for us. So let me see if this will work. Okay. So um, one of the things we want to be thinking about is what's going on in the Netherlands, in uh, you know, this prosperous Dutch golden age. And 
who is going to want to leave this um, place that is full of commerce and culture and the good life to go live in a place that is just developing, is wild, is very uncertain. Um, so we're going to get people like Penelope and her Dutch husband, as he's been described, um, because we don't know his name, um, leaving. And why would they leave? Well, based on what we've seen historically, uh, the driving forces for people to go to a place like New Netherlands to start a new life would be poverty, would be disinheritance, would be illegitimacy, uh, or would be religious freedom. So uh, about 50% of the population of, uh, you know, coming to the Americas is, you know, Protestants from all over Europe, you know, and, and frequently tied to uh, seeking religious freedom. So, um, so we see, you know, certain people attracted to wanting to come to the Americas. Um, and of course, you are also going to get, a, you know, some entrepreneurs at the, at the top of the the top of the ladder, you know, people associated with the Dutch West India Company, who's, you know, got this uh, stock venture, uh, you know, that they're they're uh, promoting. But they're going to send as many workers as they can. They're not going to be the one want to be the ones to go and live in this uh, unsettled place. They're going to send people to work for them. Um, so that's one one consideration. The other thing to think about is to think about the name that we first learn about that is said to be Penelope's name. So in the, uh, in the Benedict version of, uh, of Penelope's story, they mention Penelope Van Princess. So we get the name Penelope, okay? And so this is a name that goes back to, you know, ancient history, goes back to the, to the, to the Odyssey of Homer and Penelope as the ideal wife, you know, the most devoted wife and the most ingenious wife, the one who, who waits for her husband Odysseus to return and, and you know, outwits all these suitors who are staying uh, and trying to uh, you know, have, her, have her interest, but she's gonna be devoted and wait for her husband to return. So you get you know, depictions of, in this case, uh, Odysseus is represented as Ulysses, right? So you get uh, depictions of that. So we don't have you know, a deliverance or a patience, you know, some of those uh, uh, Protestant names that we see emerging, but we've got a Penelope here. And then the other thing would be different interpretations of the last name Van Princess. So Van meaning from or um, or or, um, but being royal. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that she comes from royalty. It could be someone who is also acting royal. And uh, so Benedict says that this was her name prior to marriage, if that's accurate or not. But that's the statement that is made. So we get this interesting name that's presented. And so, um, so we see you know, this group that starts to depart for, um, for uh, New Amsterdam for the New Netherlands. So 17th century New Amsterdam, far across the Atlantic Ocean. So we're talking about, you know, taking this long journey across the ocean. Um, so in 1624, the uh, West India Company sponsors the first group of arrivals. There's tw uh, excuse me, 30 Walloon families that arrive on the ship, the New Netherland. And um, they are there to work for the, uh, the West India Company. And you know, they're interested in trade. They're interested in uh, fur trade. Um, so, so we get initially this uh, venture. And then uh, gradually over time, uh, more people are going to arrive. So by uh, 1655, we have New Netherland um, uh, with a population of about 2,000. Um, and uh, about 1,500 people living in New Amsterdam proper. So um, we're going to see a gradual building up of the population. And by the year 1664, uh, the time when Penelope and has later married Richard Staten, they're going to go over and uh, move to Middletown, settle Middletown. By then, New Netherland is up to 9,000. So, but we're talking starting out really, really small population. So um, the other thing is that the uh, the 
the West India Company is going to start out trying at first exclusively to be uh, a trade center and they're going to give up that trade monopoly after 1640 and they're going to invite other groups to come in and engage in other enterprises so you're going to get more people arriving who want to settle down in one place become farmers and so forth so it isn't just for trade purposes um, so we get a couple different um, leaders in new netherland um, who are guiding the direction of the enterprise and uh, a couple notable ones. Uh, the first one that needs to be mentioned is Wilhelm Keft, and he is in charge from 1638 to 1647. And he is significant for a couple reasons. Um, one reason is he is going to have an extremely acrimonious relationship with the Lenape, the Native Americans, and there's going to be a, a war that breaks out that bears his name, Keft's War. He's also going to be the one to offer a patent and invite um, uh, Lady Deborah Moody to establish Brave at Bravesend. And this is an, uh, an English settlement in New Netherland. And this is uh, adjacent to Co present day Coney Island. So, uh, so that he plays a couple important roles here. And then following Keft, uh, Keft is going to be dismissed as a director general and uh, interestingly, while he's sailing back home uh, to Amsterdam, his ship goes down and he is lost at sea. But he is replaced by Peter Stuyvesant, a very you know familiar name, uh, you know, still used uh, in in New York to this day. And Stuyvesant is going to be the last um, director general of uh, of the uh, of the Dutch West India Company just prior to uh, you know the English coming in and taking over. So, um, so we get this voyage that takes place across the Atlantic, where uh, Penelope and her first husband are, you know, coming to uh, to New Amsterdam. And so, the way Samuel Smith tells it, we get the Dutch ship coming from Amsterdam, stranded on Sandy Hook. Um, a young Dutchman who had been sick most of the voyage was taken so bad after the landing that he could not travel. His wife would not leave him, and the rest go on to, uh, to New Amsterdam. They promised to send help. So, uh, so a couple things to be aware of when we're dealing with this. On average, we're talking about a, a approximately three months to cross the Atlantic, depending on the wind, you know, what, what wind is going to fill the sails. So, um, so this is an arduous journey. And um, the map we're looking at is from uh, 1656. It's uh, by uh, Van der Donk. And uh, it's got uh, some interesting features on it. So you can see um, on this one that Sandy Hook is, they have a, a Sandy Point, uh, and it's attached as a barrier beach. Sandy Hook is going to change shapes over time. At some points, it's not always atta attached to the mainland. So we've got Sandy Hook sticking up there, where you know, right where, uh, right below where it says Port May, Godwin's Bay. Um, so we've got uh, we've got this area there, the approach to New York, present day New York Harbor, and this is where this strip, this ship becomes stranded. Um, and then you can see on here some of the uh, Dutch uh, locations. So you've got uh, New Amsterdam, and in tiny, tiny print just below it, you have. Pavonia, which is present day uh, Jersey City, and this is an early uh, Dutch settlement on the Jersey side. And then you can also see um, some of the different Lenape groups as noted by the, um, by the Dutch. So you've got the Raritan, and you've got the Madovankan, and you've got, you know, all throughout uh, the, the uh, general area, the different Lenape groups. So um, you know, interesting interpretations. The one feature that I find interesting is if you look down towards Cape May at the bottom of New Jersey, uh, that there is an impression that there's mountains down there. So you get these, you know, mountains, hills drawn in there, which is not not accurate. But you know, um, they've got the uh, the Hudson River there, the North River. They've got the Delaware River, the South River there, and uh, further to the south too, you're going to have the other. Um, 
enterprise that was established, that of New Sweden, you know, the Swedes and the Finns making their impact in Southern Jersey. So, um, so we get this story. We don't know exactly. Um, um, oh, okay. So can anybody, can everybody else see the slides? I do see them. Um, I let me chat with her kind of on the side to see what's going okay. on. All righty. I'm going to go to the next slide. So I don't see the slides either. Okay. You always. We certainly do. Okay, so it's a mixed thing. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> I okay. see. Okay, thanks. So, um, so. This slide I wanted to share because as this ship becomes stranded around Sandy Hook, whenever it happened, um, you know, it is being stranded at a place that has limited European settlement. You know, New Jersey, for the most part, is occupied by the Native Americans, uh, the Lenape, and um, to the Dutch. And indeed, to all the Europeans, uh, these Indians were all wilden. They were savages. And so, you know, they're engaged in fur trade with these Lenape, you know, but they are not trusting them. And so one of the things that we have to be aware of is the lifestyle of these Native Americans and how it's in such cultural conflict with the Europeans. So we get uh, these different Lenape bands, you know, as you can see here with the different um, dialects, the different lang uh, variations of their language that they spoke depending on where they lived. But they would move around within their particular region and beyond to, to trade, but also it's a semi-nomadic life because they do have agricultural settlements where they grow corn, but then they're going to travel when it's when the fish are running in, you know, like on the Delaware, they're going to go fishing. When it's time to harvest shellfish, they're going to go there. So they're not like they are necessarily settled in a permanent location. They're very, very flexible. And they have a very um, strong interrelationship with their environment. So they don't have the same concept of ownership of the land. As they look at it, the resources are for everyone. So there's this cultural conflict because the Lenape see peaches growing on a tree and they say, wow, these look good, I'm gonna go pick them. And some farmer whose orchard it is, is gonna be very, very angry. And so also too, when the land is so-called purchased, the exchange is not fully, you know, understood as such. So there, there are these, you know, cultural conflicts going on between the Native Americans and the Europeans that are there. So um, this uh, this uh, uh, person who is the uh, director general of the D Dutch West India Company, Keft, uh, between 1639. And 1645, there's something called Keth's War. And this is a back and forth fighting between the Native Americans and the Dutch of New Netherlands. And on one event, to give you an idea of how brutal it gets, on one event in Pavonia, present day Jersey City, there is this massacre that takes place on February 25th, 1643. And there are accounts of this. Uh, where there's a slaughter of 80 Lenape men, women, and children. So there, there is definitely sometimes high feeling going on between the Native Americans and the Europeans um, living in this area. So depending on the particular groups of Native Americans, some of them may be more kindly disposed if they've had favorable relationships, maybe with trade. There's going to be others that are going to be angry if they, you know, if something, you know, has happened to them that is not so favorable. So take a look at this map and take a look at the Navasink and the Raritan. So you get different Lenape groups uh, poised very close to the area where um, Penelope's ship is stranded. So there could be any, um, you know, 
number of different Indian groups who might be passing through who could have been the ones to attack her. And so, you know, the story is, you know, uh, she stays with her husband, the other uh, travelers want some versions of the story, most versions of the story say, you know, they go on to New Amsterdam to seek help. There's a couple um, stout versions that say that everybody drowns except Penelope and her husband. So there's, you know, a couple different versions out there. But um, if we are to believe that the majority of the passengers make their way and then Penelope and her husband are either on Sandy Hook or near Navasink, you know, awaiting assistance, um, this is where, you know, this terrible, terrible attack takes place. And so to share this story, um, you know, it's, it's brutal. And so um, one of the treatments of it is a poem by one of the descendants, uh, 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 Penelope Shambly Schott, and she wrote a whole series of poems that describe Penelope's story. So this is the particular poem that talks about the, the Indian attack. And so um, they come with fishing nets and weapons, bows and arrows over the shoulder and a stone ax tucked at the belt. Three tall and well-formed, all young, their heads shaven, except a feathered center crust, crest, excuse me. First, they see the broken boat stuck on the shallow bar and speak among themselves and now see us. Swift butchers, first my husband, an ax to his back, he groans once and falls, the loose and reddening sand. Now three upon me, fast, each to destroy. My belly axed open, my arm nearly off, my hair yanked back and cut, cut away from my skull, and the sea and the sky turn black and black and nothing at all. Moonrise over the wretched spar, with one arm, I gather my glistening guts and crawl toward a hollow tree, and I see one star. So, um, you know, I find this so evocative, you know, this literary treatment of, uh, you know, Penelope's uh, attack um, and how this, you know, how this could have possibly been for her. So, um, according to the Samuel Smith story, and as depicted on this medallion that was made in the 1970s by uh, artist Don DeLue, um, there's, there's uh, later on after Penelope has been staying for a time in this hollowed out tree and she's been finding like a little bit of moisture there and she's been eating as, as both the Smith and Benedict accounts say, excrescences, you know, fungus, lichen, something growing in the tree, which was probably really good. I'm guessing it had penicillin in it. So uh, so here she is in terrible shape. And, uh, you know, the old Indian and the young one come down the beach and they have the conversation about whether to keep her alive, whether to kill her. And then the older Indian prevails, picks her up and takes her to where he is currently living in, in uh, this area where present day Middletown is and he dresses her wounds and, and saves her. So, you know, one can only imagine, um, you know, based on uh, the nature of her wounds, um, how horrific this must have been and what it must have taken, uh, you know, to cure her. This must have taken a while. We're not talking, you know, a week or two um, in order to be sewn up, you know, to have her uh, entrails, you know, uh, back where they belong and, uh, and uh, to heal up, you know, based on the, the shoulder and the head injury, as this is really, really major stuff. So um, when we look at a modern map of the Bayshore area, including Middletown, we get some places here that give us some idea of you know, where these events play out now and then later on in the future when Penelope and her second husband, um, you know, uh, uh, Richard Stadt are going to come and settle um, Middletown. So we've got a couple uh, landmarks here. So you can see um, right in the middle of the map, um, Kings Highway and uh, Highway 35. 
Uh, so that's an important location there for the founding of Middletown. And then if you go a little bit further to the west and then you see the Garden State Parkway, there's another area there where it says Crawford's Corner. This is right where the juncture is between Middletown and Homedale. This is another location that's associated with um, the uh, Scouts and, and, and their, their land and their farmstead. So we've got, uh, we've got this area and this is in general, this area surrounding here is where, you know, where Penelope is nursed back to health. So, um, so going on to the next slide, um, I, I include a uh, image from the, uh, the drawing from the uh, Frank Stockton story, that, that one that was first published in, uh, in the 1890s that became so popular. And when I look at this picture of Penelope, you know, laboring as she lives among the, the Lenape, I'm thinking to myself, uh, how does she look so well-dressed? You know, uh, clearly uh, based on what she's been through, I can't imagine that her clothing held up in that way. So, you know, this is the artistic interpretation. So, um, so uh, according to the Smith and then uh, Benedict versions of the story, uh, we get, you know, that the Dutch becoming aware that there's a white woman among the Indians and, um, you know, and they, uh, they came uh, to, you know, see what, what was going on. And then, um, you know, they asked, uh, do you want to go or you want to stay? And she chose to go with them. Um, and that that would be consistent with Len, the Lenape approach. So we we have more of an egalitarian society among the Lenape, as with most Native Americans, where women had much more say. Um, lineage is determined through the mother's side of the family. So um, children growing up, they have relationships with their father, but very importantly, with their mother's brothers, their uncles. Uh, so, you know, we get a very strong female presence uh, among the Lenape. So that would make sense that she would be given a choice. She isn't, it isn't decided for her as it might be in European, uh, you know, uh, societies. So, um, so one of the uh, things that comes up here too is, um, you can see the difference between the, the Samuel Smith version and the David Benedict version because we get um, more precise giving of names in the Benedict version. Uh, we get, um, we get you know, Richard Stout mentioned, and then we get specific ages and years of marriage, and then names of children that follow. So, uh, and so this is, you know, of course, one of the uh, amazing things for those of us that know her story is she survives this horrendous attack. She is nursed back to health, and then she goes on to bear ten children. Um, you know, just just astounding. So, um, so a couple considerations here to to be thinking about. Um, in general, life expectancy in the late 16th and early 17th century was about 40 years. Now, that takes into account the high infant and child mortality. 12% uh, of, of children born are going to die within their first year, and amazingly, up to 60% by age 16. So, uh, because of the uh, circumstances of life, if you could make it up to young adulthood, you are going to live probably a, a, a decent sized life, a de decent length life. Um, life in the Americas, um, in contrast to that in Europe, was actually a little bit healthier. You have less urban crowding with less polluted water, and you have less disease breaking out. Of course, for the Native Americans, they have no natural immunities. So whatever diseases the Europeans bring are just going to decimate the Lenape and any Native Americans. The estimates are that up to 90% of all Native American population um, was killed by disease or war within the first couple hundred years of European arrival. So, um, so you know, so we get um, actually a little bit better prospect for life expectancy by virtue of coming to the new world because it's a little bit cleaner living. Um, uh, the typical English woman in the Americas would give birth to about eight children, according to uh, the data from the Plymouth Plantation and the New England um, uh, Genealogical Society. So uh, Penelope 
even surpassed that. So that's, that's a pretty uh, amazing feat. So what's interesting, you'll notice um, they talk about Penelope being taken from this Lenape uh, settlement where she was staying. And um, they talk about the Dutch at New Amsterdam. They talk about, of course, in New York, it, has, it doesn't turn into New York just yet. But, um, but they don't mention where she really does end up which is in Gravesend. And um, so Gravesend is a really um, interesting uh, location because uh, that same uh, director general who is fighting the Lenape, he is granting uh, a section of Long Island for the establishment of a community of English Anabaptists. Um, and so, this community is established beginning in 1643, and then by 1645, Lady Deborah Moody and a growing group of Anabaptists are living in Gravesend. And this is significant for a couple reasons. Um, Lady Deborah Moody is the first woman to found a settlement in the New World, and she is credited with designing the layout of Gravesend. Um, so we have her becoming an Anabaptist. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that there is a belief that baptism should be something that an adult chooses for themselves, that, that the, the baptism given to infants did not have as much significance. And um, Lady Moody is a woman of education. She's a woman of refinement, and she has a very strong force of character. Uh, so she is going to encourage religious toleration. Um, Anabaptists are considered kind of left-wing Protestants, but even more, you know, radical would be like the Quakers, and they would welcome Quakers. And you know, Quakers are problematic even in tolerant uh, New Amsterdam. So, um, so we get uh, we get Penelope coming to live in a Gravesend. So this raises something that uh, you know a number of people have, have spoken about when they look at um, her story. Why does she end up there instead of New Amsterdam? And the logical uh, you know, connection would be is because she has a connection to these folks that she is perhaps, uh, you know, uh, her family members could have been Anabaptist, could have been English. So if they thought it made the most sense for her to be in Gravesend as opposed to New Amsterdam. And it is there where eventually she marries Richard Stout, who has already been living in Gravesend, and he's very prosperous there. And, um, and so that's, you know, and they start to have their, their family there. So, uh, so in the uh, documents for Gravesend, there's a book that uh, was published in 1884 that's a history of, of Gravesend. Uh, by Stockwell, uh, they talk about um, the town book and the different trials that take place, the different hearings to settle disputes within the town. And Penelope's name comes up in 1648. She's a witness in a slander trial. So one family has accused another family of milking their cow, of basically stealing the milk from their cow. And um, Penelope gave testimony and she apologizes for speaking out of turn. So apparently she saw something, she, uh, she, she made an accusation or she said something, but she later you know, uh, apologized for speaking out, right? Keeping, the, keeping her place as a woman and keeping to her role as not uh, speaking out of turn. So uh, she is documented as appearing in the town record in 1648. So, um, so we get uh, we get knowledge that we know that Penelope is there, and she's listed in 1648 as Penelope Prince. She isn't listed as Penelope Stout. So, we could perhaps infer that she was not married at that time. Although they could have referred back to her, you know, her name. I'm not sure. So, at any rate, we do know that Richard Stout and Penelope do get married. They have children, and then we're going to have the Monmouth Patent. So when the English uh, conquer New Netherland, um, and then there is a desire by the, uh, by the English to really establish locations, we have the Monmouth Patent. And so uh, as reported in the history of Monmouth County, 
we get, uh, you know, John Bowne and Richard Stout, original lot owners of the Middletown Village. And so we get this, this famous Monmouth patent. And then here um, is one of the stories that is uh, depicted um, in, uh, in the versions of, uh, of the, um, the different, um, the different uh, uh, stories about her. So one of these stories that comes up is that when Penelope and her family settle in Middletown, she is in close proximity to the old Indian who had saved her life and that they, he visits her. And so, you know, the one thing that I stopped to think about is how they probably communicated, right? So clearly she had to learn some Lenape, he had to learn some English. Um, so that must have been very interesting. They must have had some way to communicate with one another and how, how did that work, right? Um, now in the, uh, in the Stockton story, the one that was, you know, the popular version, they have Penelope as a young mother with just a couple children and that's what's being depicted here. So the, the older Indian comes to warn Penelope when he hears that there's going to be an Indian uprising and that they're going to be attacking the settlers. He comes to warn her and tells her, get in a canoe you know go to new amps uh, go to new york get get make yourself safe and penelope tells her husband and they have this conference with the indians and they avert the fighting so they tell the story that way but uh based on the other accounts that we're aware of penelope had uh, the majority of her children prior to coming to um to uh to uh to middletown so the family was larger than that uh, best we can tell so, um, so at any rate, you know, we get this, uh, this story of Penelope returning to the very close to the place where she was nursed back to health and living in Middletown. And, um, and then, you know, uh, from there, you know, we hear about the, uh, the settlement, we hear about her husband having a role in helping develop, um, you know, the Middletown village and, and, you know, and what's going on there. But we, you know, Penelope's story starts to uh, fade away and we do have you know um when uh when richard stout dies we do have penelope listed in his will as the you know the person who inherits from him as well as his children inheriting so um so one of the other challenges is you know beyond these um early sources and then the versions that have come out over time you know what other traces are there out there and um, so there are, you know, some um, local traditions about where Penelope eventually was buried. We don't know for sure. Uh, the one local tradition says that she is buried at the uh, the uh, burial ground for the Throckmorton Lippitt Taylor uh, burial ground near Penelope Lane and uh, Kings Highway on Highway 35 in Middletown. Uh, but there's no grave marker for her. There is this rather weathered sign, which I have not seen in person. Um, I don't know if it's still there, but it certainly looks like it has been around a while. Um, so, you know, we have that general farmstead area that the Stouts had, but we don't know where Penelope is buried. Um, we have these accounts that she lived to be 110 years old. We don't know for sure. I mean, even if she lived to be 90, even if she lived to be 80, it's amazing. Um, and then, of course, you know, we get um, different treatments of Penelope uh, by authors. So the so the the poetry uh, that we saw earlier, and then one of the more significant writers is this person, uh, Jim McFarland, who came out with a novel. And of course, what I really appreciate about it is he says it's a novel. He's not saying it's a history. He's admitting that he's doing a literary treatment of her story. And so that came out in 2012 and it's out of print. You really can't get a copy of it. I would have, uh, I would have purchased a copy if I could have gotten my hands on one uh, for you know, less than an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, so we get you know, uh, you know, these different uh, approaches to looking at Penelope. And of course the Facebook groups, um, I, I belong to two. I belong to the Stout family DNA group where you upload your um, DNA. And that last time I checked, there were three, 343 members that are doing that and comparing 
their DNA and sometimes they see a match and sometimes not. I mean, for me, Penelope is like 10th or 11th generation. So the, the DNA really gets diluted by that point. But there are people that are, are finding uh, connections. Um, and then there's an even larger Facebook group, the Penelope Stout Descendants that did a lot of good promotion for this program. So I hope you found it worth your while. And they have over 2,000 300 members so uh you know so penelope's reach is really vast and uh so we you know we've got uh we've got that to continue to sustain us as we look at her so um my last slide um so the way samuel smith um you know uh wraps up his account of her story you know from this woman thus remarkably saved with her scars visible through a long life, is descended a numerous posterity in the name of Stout, now inhabiting New Jersey. And that was back in you know, 1765. Now we can say across the United States and other locations. So, you know, uh, a modern interpretation of Penelope Stout would be, she's truly a wonder woman. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, some of the bits and pieces that have come up in the family genealogies really tell little tidbits that are compelling. There's one that comes up where it talks about um, uh, a story that was passed through several generations where um, a grandson of Penelope passed the story to his daughter who passed it to her daughter about uh, he was helping her get on a horse or into a wagon and his hand brushed against her stomach you know, where, uh, you know, she's clothed, but he you know, touched her stomach. And she said, feel that, feel that scar there. I mean, it must have been a really, you know, strong ray scar. And tell your children my story. So, I mean, you know, those kinds of things that get passed down, that's very, very powerful. So, um, so that's, that's my basic presentation, but I would love to hear what questions and comments you have, because I know so many of you are so deeply involved in uh, looking at Penelope and examining her story. Thank you so much. And yes, we do invite you to, um, to enter your chats, your questions into the chat box, and I'm happy to relay them to um, Jean to answer. I do want to remind you that we are recording so that we are asking that you keep your cameras off uh, just to make it a little bit just so we kind of lessen the bandwidth that we're using. And it just started raining where we are. So <laughs> no tornadoes though, right? <laughs> but it really is fascinating. I love the com I love the comparable, the comparison to her as Wonder Woman. I mean it's just such an amazing story and I can't believe the amount of research that that went into it. And um, I mean do you have alerts set up or something where you because I'm sure new information is coming up all the time or well, maybe see, it's and, maybe it's settled and it's not coming up all the time anymore yeah and most of the things that come up you have to really look at with a historian's eye because people make assumptions about things that yes, may or may not point. be so so that's the challenge people want to believe i mean this is an intense source of family pride right so, right um and so that's where sometimes it becomes challenging because you don't want to tell somebody, no, you're wrong, because we don't have all the facts. Yeah. That's that's, that's the thing. So I that's love what that. I'm interested in what, what people have to say. I love that term, looking through the historian's eyes. So I do have some questions that have come up, so I'll go ahead and field them to, or pose them to you to answer, okay? Um, have you come across the name Penelope Kent? I had heard this was her maiden name and that Van Princess was her first husband's name. Right. So, so one of the one of the stories that has emerged is that Penelope did didn't originate coming from New Amsterdam and sail. Excuse me, coming from Amsterdam and sailing to New Amsterdam. She was an indentured servant on Kent Island in Delaware, and so and that she fled that site and made her way up to New Amsterdam. But that, that and there is, a, there is apparently a woman with, by the name of Penelope Kent. And so, you know, how many women of this time could be named Penelope, have, you right. know, so we don't know. And it, and, it, and, it, and it throws into conflict the whole story of this attack by the Indians and her rescue. And people have said, maybe it's conflated 
with uh, you know other stories of other hmm. women attacked by Native women. We don't know, but yes, that is one of the one of the stories that floats around. Um, but we don't have any concrete proof of that. Thank so you. And um, there is, I do want to uh, point people to the chat that someone has linked to uh, the Amazon record for McFarland's book, Penelope, a novel of New Amsterdam. So if you are interested in that, there is a link in the chat to that. Yeah, I, the last time I checked, it was it was a, like a small fortune to get a copy. <laughs> Um, and I have a couple more questions. Um, when Richard Stout told, Pen told Penelope they were moving to Middletown, Middletown, am I saying that correctly? It's not Middleton, yeah. right? Middletown. Middletown, yes. What do, oh, this is interesting. What do you think Penelope's reaction was? Now, some of the accounts <laughs> say that um, she encouraged him to move to Middletown. So, so in that respect, that would inter, you know, that would infer, you know, a positive reaction. Um, yeah, and that's and that's the challenge, right? When you yeah. when you look at these stories to try to try to recognize, um, you know, how people thought about things, felt about things, and and you want to be so careful not to impose your 21st century hmm. mindset, you know, vision on it. You want to really try to imagine how it was for them. So, so the, yeah, I would say question mark. Don't know, right? We don't know for sure. She might have felt positive about it. She might have questioned it, right? I mean, she, clearly she had a relationship with this Indian that this Lenape Indian that saved her life, and he's he's given a name in some of the treatments, but we don't know his name. It's they took, they took the name of one of the Indians from a, the Indian that is known otherwise as Squanto, and they've you know, attach that to this Indian, but we, we don't know his name. Okay, that was one of the questions on here. What was, what was the name of the Lenape who helped um, helped heal? Uh, we don't, became we don't her know. Friend. Okay. We don't know. And then do you think Penelope was English and not Dutch? The primary source material, um, and in parentheses, court document, says her name is Penelope Prince, not, oh, Penelope Prince, not Van Princess. One of the things, once you start doing any kind of genealogical research on, on your family, you see the incredible variation with last names, the different writings, different interpretations. So I kind of take all those names with a grain of salt. Okay? So, <laughs> and and the, 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 the closest calculated guess that I make is that she had strong connections to to an English background because that's why she ends up in Graves, Gravesend. So, okay. I mean, and just, you know, because there's there's been some account, there's some records that have come up that uh, point to a Penelope who's born in Stepney, England. And there's some things that say that she was born in uh, Amsterdam, you know, don't know for sure. And it's, it's, you know, just because we see a birth record of a woman named Penelope, we don't know for sure that that is that exact person. We can't right. always assume, assume those things. Um, and this is the kind of stuff where um, you can really um, you can really dig in and really investigate and then just make your 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 best guess going forward. So I'm still I'm still like hedging. I'm tentative. I don't, <laughs> don't feel like I, I know categorically. Oh, yes, that's the case. You know, um, I do have people thanking you for such a wonderful presentation. I do have some people asking about the recording. There will be a recording of the program available. Once it's available, I will be emailing um, the attendees from this evening's program. So you will have uh, an access to that. And I do have some more questions that are coming in. Yeah. Um, there is the implication that Richard Stout came from a well-placed family. My understanding was that Richard left Europe during a family rift. Any now, do you have any knowledge of that? I've seen it mentioned. I don't know what the sources are to back it up. So what happens lots of times with these different stories is they'll tell you this happened to so-and-so, but they don't tell you where the information comes from. So then you have to go and research it and check it out yourself. But that's, yes, that's one of, that's one of the stories that floats about for Richard is that he uh, apparently had a love relationship back at home and it was frowned upon by his family and he left and then he was in the Navy for a while and then he ends up in Gravesend. Hmm. That's that's the story, but but I, I have never seen, according to 
I just hear the story. And that's where I always, unless I see an according to, and I know that it's a verifiable source, that's right. where I put that question mark. Excellent. Um, is there an account that her arm was injured? Uh, uh, this uh, participant has heard that she never regained use of one of her arms. That's repeated in numerous versions of this uh, of this story. So that's one of the one of the things is that when you see that description, it it comes time and time again about her never fully regaining use of the arm. And in one of the other descriptions that comes through the genealogies is that she always wore something a head covering because of the uh, the permanent damage to her scalp. Huh. Okay. And it's on that. Um, when you were showing the patent, I think on the what she was like the first first lady of um, Middletown. Um, yes, yeah. thank you. And I think someone was it looked like someone was helping her with an I just remember seeing that it was very distinct to me the, her yeah. someone helping her with their arm. Um, and then I have a question. Are there any records of the East India Company that contain passenger lists or information about the ships? The West India Company. Yeah. So uh, oh, the West so, India Company. OK. Yeah. Yeah, because the East India Company is on the other side of the world. So um, there are some accounts, but there's, they're not uniform. They're not, you know, they're, so one of the things people have attempted to do, and there's been people, stout people on, on these uh, Facebook pages who've actually gone to the Netherlands and, you know, look things up. So there are some accounts, but they're not always complete. They're not always systematic. And there was one person who was able to find a particular ship called the Cat that had been beached and she said, oh, it's gotta be Penelope's ship, but then the dates don't coincide. You know, it's, it, the dates are off. So it's like, once again, we don't know. We so, don't know. Uh, so, so one of the things that comes up when historians write about um, New Netherland and the, they, that there are some records, but they're not kept consistently. So that, you know, we may never, we may never know. And then do you have any idea of the population of Graveshead? Ah, that is a good question. Let me see if I scribbled it down here. It was a rather small group. And what I'll do um, if that person wants to, uh, there were 14 initially. There were 14 families that started Gravesend. So, um, and there were uh, eventually 40 farms surrounding the village. So while that doesn't give you an exact population count, it does give you a, like a basic estimate of, of, of the size over time. So, um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's what I pulled up based on this uh, 19th century history of Gravesend. Okay, thank you. And then Brian Klopp did research on Penelope and found her and Richard mentioned in several documents. He said Richard signed with a mark and was illiterate. Was she the brains of the family? Uh, well, a lot of people were illiterate back then. Yeah. So it may have been as well. So yeah, so I, so I would say they, I'm sure it was a joint brain trust because he's very involved in other you know, activities with, with early Middletown. And then I have someone who is asking, I think, for a recommendation on someone who is very knowledgeable about the Lenape. Do you have any um, authors or researchers that you can point us to? Oh, look, she's yeah. going to a book. <laughs> yeah. A slim volume from a few years ago um, by Dowd. This is part of the um, New Jersey uh, his history series, The Indians of New Jersey, Gregory Evans Dowd. So this is a nice nice skinny volume with lots of good content. And then for the true, the true aficionado, one of the great scholars of uh, Lenape um, lore and history is the late Herbert Kraft of Seton Hall. And um, there is this nice hefty volume, I don't know if it's still available or not, called Lenape Delaware Indian Heritage. And uh, so he did a lot of archaeological work, um, and then his son took over from him. But the he is he is the the person, and there are still, of course, people doing work today. But these are the two volumes that I have that I 
go to first. And then, of course, there's always new articles coming out as more, uh, you know, uh, archaeological work is being done. Just an interesting side note, the second book, um, The Lenape Delaware Indian Heritage uh, by Kraft, that one, we have it in our collection, and I actually pulled that this morning. Someone had requested it, so, so it's out there. It's available. Glad to see that it's still being used. Yes, I, I was funny because I pulled it, and I'm like, this is interesting that this is being pulled today. So someone might be out there doing their research before tonight's program. And and the thing, too, with Kraft's book, it's, it's a several, several years old now. But you use it as a starting point, and then you see what has somebody done since then. Because there's always revision. There's always, you know, new things. So there's, you know, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe some further information about Penelope will emerge, either based on archaeological work. Maybe they'll find something when they're digging around Middletown. Or maybe some other records will emerge, that have been, and then we can reinterpret. But we can always, you know, look at what we have and then just try to, you know, uh, analyze it. And then, so that's, that's the perennial challenge. Thank you. And we do have more thank yous that are coming through. Very interesting, love the historical perspective. Um, someone has recommended another book and I will compile the list of books that have been mentioned tonight. And I will also send that out in a follow-up email along with a link to the recording, um, just for those people who didn't get a chance to write them down. Uh, it is, um, Lenape Country, Delaware Valley Society Before William Penn um, by Saller, S-A-L-L-E-R. That's a book that people have, that someone is recommending as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, and yeah, because there's a number, I mean, you could build a library, of course. Absolutely, know. yes. And you are just getting oodles of thank yous coming through. I don't know if you can see them on your end. Um, oh, and there is another question. Was James the name of one of her children? Um, you know, there's a couple different lists that come up. So um, let me go and take a look at uh, what they said. So according to Benedict, James was. So uh, David, uh, so Benedict says that uh, she, her children were Jonathan, John, Richard, James, Peter, David, Benjamin, Mary, Sarah, and Alice. But there are other lists that have some other names, but that's what that's who Benedict says. I know some of the uh, the female names are different in some different lists. Okay. So, always a challenge. And again, I'm just getting kudos and thank yous. And well, so and I it, thank you and I thank you for you know putting up with my fumbling around with the technology. So it's uh, and I I ditto that. Thank you to everybody for your patience this evening. I think personally, I think it was worth the wait. <laughs> it was such a fascinating, such a fascinating presentation. And I do want to thank again um, Bob Warsnack and Bob News. Uh, Bob News was helping behind the scenes tonight, and of course Bob Warsnack is with the Hopewell Valley Historical Society and the Hopewell Museum. And of course, um, Jean, I cannot thank you enough for the time that you took. It, it was just really oh, a wonderful presentation. And thank yeah, you and all, all of you. I'm going, to keep, I'm going to keep working on Penelope. So, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be something <laughs> in the future. And thank you all for attending this evening. And we hope to see you around the library and stay safe out there. And we will see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jean. That was amazing. Okay, take care now. Yes, you too.